Hare Krishna. So today morning, I'll speak on the topic of making our dealings more personal. How we can, are we kind of personal dealings, more personal with each other. And I'll speak three points. And after each point, we can have some reflection or question if you have any. The first point is that Krishna is a person and is personal. Second point is that see people not just as philosophical categories but as conscious beings. And third point is that take time to form high resolution understanding of people. So let me go over these points. So the first point is Krishna is person and is personal. So here the setting is that Krishna is just returned to Dwarka and he is being welcomed by various people. And all these people who are welcoming him, Krishna is reciprocating with them. Yatha vidhi upasangamya as is appropriate. This was described earlier also when Krishna went to meet the Pandavas in Hastinapur or in Indraprastha, depending on where they were. So there, Krishna was more or less of the same age as Arjun. So Krishna would embrace Arjun. And Bhima was also equal. Yudhishthir was older. So Krishna would offer his respects to Yudhishthir. And Krishna would give his blessings to Nakul and Sahadev. They would bow down to him. So the idea is that Krishna is recognizing each person where they are and reciprocating with them appropriately. So God is that we, God is not just an abstract philosophical principle. You know, in the Greek tradition, uh, the many Greek thinkers like Aristotle and others, they had the idea that God is the unmoved first, unmoved mover. That means we need the universe to begin, so there has to be some beginning principle. But he said that the God is the unmoved mover. That means he sets everything in motion, but he is like a static principle. However, the dharmic texts explain that yes, God at one level is unmoved. That means he is not affected by anything material. But at the same time, he is not, he's not impersonal. He is not a mere principle. He is a person. And he is a person because the world has personality. Now, we all have personalities. We, Living beings have personalities. Now as people are coming closer and closer to animals because of having pets, they understand pet, each pet has its individuality also. So where would the individuality, which is a fundamental feature of reality, come from unless it was present in the source of everything, that is the absolute. So, of course, in the bhakti tradition that God is a person is a implicit, it's a given. But it's very endearing to understand how Krishna is personal. So I'll talk a couple of examples from the Gopal Champu and the Anandandavan Champu. These are two books written by our Acharyas. Gopal Champu is written by Jibba Swami and Anandandavan Champu is written by Kavi Karnapur. And there they describe Krishna's dealings in Vrindavan. So not just with people, with all living beings, Krishna is personal. Even with his cows. The Krishna has a name for each cow. And he has countless cows. And after some time, generally if we meet a lot of people, after some time, it's just our brain becomes saturated. We can't remember so many names. But it's, it's, the face is familiar, the person is familiar, but it's just the name we don't get it. Now Krishna, he has countless cows, but he remembers every cow by the name. And then, when at the end of the day of herding, Krishna has to get all the cows back. Now each cow, or not, not so much cow, like a calf, or calf or cow, generally Krishna is a, in Vrindavan he is still a boy. And he is taking small cows. So the cows and the cows have their names. And when Krishna is calling the cow, the cows back, the cows back, he calls each one by name. And there are some cows, they also know they have to go home. But they just go far away so that Krishna will call their name repeatedly. And Krishna calls their name repeatedly, they hear it. And 
I feel, oh, Krishna is calling me with so much love, so much affection, so much an intimate concern that Krishna has for each cow. And when Krishna comes back every evening, so all of Vrindavan comes to the outskirts to look. And when they are coming, they see that first there is a dust cloud that rises. The dust cloud rises because Krishna is preceded by the cows and cows and their hooves cause a dust to rise. And normally a dust cloud obscures vision. And if we can't see, we'll get, we'll get annoyed. But when the dust clouds are rising, the Vrajivasis become excited. Oh yes, now Krishna is coming, Krishna is coming. So often for us in our lives also, sometimes a storm comes in our life. And the storm obscures the vision of Krishna. But through that storm, often Krishna may be coming closer to us. So then as the clouds come forward, the dust clouds subside. And then they go, they, all the Vrajivasis start seeing Krishna coming in. They are all beholding. Now they can see all the cows, they can see the cowherd boys. But they still can't catch sight of Krishna. Krishna and Balaram are at the back. They are making sure that every single one of the cows comes back. Not even one gets lost. Cows, this, they're mischievous, this, especially when they, they are frolicking in childhood. Child, so, you know, if a mother has to take care of one child, that is such a challenge. You know, two children, three children, five children. You know, if they have a lot of children, it becomes very difficult to take care of them. So now, cows are like children and Krishna is attentive. And make sure that every single cow comes back. And at the back of it, Krishna is there, all of them. Krishna is vigilantly looking at every cow. Meditating on this, the great Vaishnava poet Bilva Mangal Thakur has said that, O oh Krishna, the cows, you make sure that every single one of them comes back with you. He says, the cows are called in Sanskrit as go, and go also means senses. That's why we have the word Goswami, one who's controlled the senses. So he says, Krishna, my senses are also go. They are also, and they are also go, they are also going. They're going here, going there, going there. You don't let a single calf go away, cow go away, but all my senses are going away. Please gather them and please bring them with you, back with you, to your eternal abode of Vrindavan. So Krishna is Rishikesh, he's the lord of the senses, he's Gopal. Gopal means he's not just the protector of the cows, he's also the protector of the senses. So when Krishna comes back, the Vrajivasis, they also have their Yatha Vidhi. Now the older Vrajivasis, they all, the smaller boys, the boys have gone out. And the parents are waiting at the outskirts. Especially the mothers are eagerly waiting for Krishna to come back. But there are the gopis, they are young girls. And in that culture at that time, for the gopis to come out, for girls to come out to look at boys, that is not appropriate. So the gopis don't come out, they go to the terraces of their houses. And when they go to the terraces of their houses, from there they are beholding. And Nanda Maharaj's house is right in the middle of Vrindavan. So when Krishna comes in, he goes through, he goes through a circuitous path so that all the gopis from the houses along the way, they can behold him. And then as he enters, the gopas start running forward. They want to go home now. The cows also, they start pushing the cows. And Balram also wants to go quickly. And then suddenly, now Krishna says, Krishna starts walking very slowly. And then Balram says, come on, we'll go home. You know, mother will have prepared food for us. We can go and eat. Freshen up and we'll eat. Krishna <coughs> says, I'm tired. I'll come slowly. You go ahead. Are you sure? He said, yes, you go ahead. Now what happens is, all the gopis want to behold Krishna and Krishna also wants to behold the gopis. The Balram is like Dauji, is the older brother. So in his presence, Krishna feels shy to look at any of the gopis. So when Balram goes ahead, then Krishna feels liberated. <laughs> and then Krishna looks at every single one of the gopis who are there above in the balconies. 
looking down. The gopis offer the love of their heart to him through their eyes. And through his glance, Krishna accepts the love of their hearts and he, by his glance he offers his love to them. And every single gopi who is there, she feels that personal connection, that personal reciprocation with Krishna. Now the eyes can speak a lot. Sometimes some people, they have a smiling face, but you look at their eyes, they are so cold and suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> so, nowadays people focus a lot on, <coughs> when they want to express love, there is a lot of public display of affection. You know, hugging and kissing and all that. Now, in some cultures that might be the way of expressing affection. But actually there are sometimes the subtler ways of expressing affection are sweeter. No, gentle way. So somebody is in pain or somebody is in distress and somebody just comes and touches the shoulder. It's just comforting. So that might actually comfort the person. Yes, I'm there for you. Much more than I fuse you hug or that person is crying and you start crying with them or anything like that. So Krishna, he is personal with every single gopi. And similarly, he is personal with every single soul. That is, Krishna is present as the Paramatma in our heart. So the Paramatma is like the personal incarnation of Krishna for each one of us. The Krishna in incarnates your Sambhavami Yuge Yuge, he comes in each yuga, that is there. But along with that, Krishna manifests in the world in a personal manifestation for each one of us. Avibhaktam cha vibhakteshu, that he is one, but still he is separate. There is one super soul, but the one super soul manifests in many different forms. And Krishna feels our pains, Krishna feels our joys, Krishna knows our struggles. Krishna is personally there with each one of us in our hearts as the super soul. So Krishna is not just a person, he is also personal. That was the first point I was going to make. Any comments or questions about this? Okay. How, how do we connect with the personal aspect of Krishna? Generally, the way to do it is by hearing more and more about his personal reciprocations. Like say, we discussed some pastime, so right now. So, when we hear different pastimes of Krishna, we might ourselves find some, some pastimes which touch our hearts. So, we can try to hear more about those pastimes. Maybe memorize some verses related to those pastimes. Keep some pictures of those pastimes. So, because we are persons, so it's not that every single pastime of Krishna will be equally attracting our hearts. Yes, all pastimes of Krishna will be purifying. But we have to find out some, some aspects of Krishna, they, we feel very attracted to them. So then, we try to connect more with that. So if every day Krishna is decorated and dressed nicely, but some days the darshan might capture our heart. So then cherish that. So wherever we feel a personal connection with Krishna, try to develop that. And gradually by that, we will be able to connect with Krishna's personal aspect. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay. So the second point is that, you know, our topic is that in becoming more personal in our dealings. So we have heard of Krishna is person and is personal. Now we too need to become personal and that means we, we see people as conscious beings, not as philosophical categories. Now what do I mean by philosophical categories? I travel across the world and many devotees tell me that and we feel that other devotees treat us so impersonally. In fact, I was at an interfaith forum in Washington DC and we were talking about experiences. So there are some other devotees also. I said that there are some spiritual teachers and spiritual members who are from who whose philosophical orientation is impersonal. But sometimes they are more personal in their dealings 
then devotees whose actually philosophical orientation is personal. So you wonder why does this happen? Well, this happens because of a misapplication of a principle. What, ha what is the misapplication? That if there is, there is Kanishta Adhikari, there is Madhyam Adhikari, there is Uttam Adhikari. Kanishta Adhikari is a person who is a uh, who sees God only in the deities. Madhyam Adhikari, Kanishta is a first level devotee. Madhyam Adhikari is a second level devotee. Uh, or you could say third level, second level and first level. So the lowest and the highest. So the second level devotee learns to discern. Okay, this person is an envious person. Let me keep away from him. Ishwarita Dhirishu Balisheshu Dishal Sucha Prema Maitri Krupa Bheksha Yakaroti Samadhyama So Ishwara, for the Ishwara that is devotion. Prema, then Tad Adhineshu For those who are his devotees that is Maitri. Krupa, for those who are innocent those who are innocent, for them there is, there is compassion, there is mercy. And we should sue. For those who are envious, we keep a distance. Upeksha. This is how a Madhyam Adhikari is meant to differentiate. So to some extent, differentiation or we could use the word discrimination. Although the word discrimination today has a strongly negative connotation. But differentiation is a characteristic of knowledge that means say a person who is who is sick and a person who is healthy to ordinary eyes if a person is not very sick that person might look normal only but if somebody has some, maybe some spots on their face or something the, a doctor may indicate oh you're getting the signs of smallpox oh really others might think just some small if some figures are some small spots are there on the face so differentiation is indicative of knowledge. When we have knowledge, we can differentiate, and it's important to differentiate uh, that okay, who is a who is a person who is a materialistic person, who is from impersonalist orientation, who what people's orientations are, philosophical orientations. It's important to differentiate that. So there are philosophical categories like this. So many places Krishna gives philosophical categories. He says four kinds of people come to me, four kinds of people don't come to me. So we have these philosophical categories. And then within bhakti circles also we may have philosophical categories. Oh, like this is my God family. This is this is the Guru's disciple. So we have these categories like this. Now many times we reduce people to philosophical categories. But people are conscious beings. They are not not philosophical categories. So when we start treating, say somebody is from an impersonalist background. And then there's some devotees, for them, their conception of preaching is that they have learned some script and wherever they meet, just download that script. Now, well, that's one way of preaching. Actually, preaching means to also understand where a person is at and what is the obstacle for them to come to Krishna and help remove that obstacle. So, we might just, somebody, somebody who starts paying a lot of attention to scriptural study. Then, there's some devotees, he's a jnani. He's studying his bhakti scripture, that is not jnani. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody starts paying a lot of attention to say, fasting on ekadashi or following rules very meticulously. You are becoming a smartha. You are becoming a smartha brahman kind of person. Smartha brahman is a very ritualistic kind of adherent of the literal word of scripture. Uh, somebody starts uh, behaving in a particular way, immediately we impose a philosophical category on that person. And then what happens? Once the philosophical category comes between us and them, we can't have a personal bond. So many times, especially if you're dealing with new people. So if you're dealing with new people at that time, often, they may be coming from some spiritual background, some religious background, some traditional background. And they may have certain understanding based on that. And if they tell, uh, say somebody is from this organization, oh, that is a Mayavadi organization. You are Mayavadi. Now, when you start using labels like this, we fix labels on people like this, we alienate them. So sometimes we literally use those words, sometimes we don't use those words, but we 
we we keep that prominently in the mind say if say i am looking at you right now and i keep my hand in between me between you and me then the closer the hand is to me then go to my eyes the lesser i can see you like all that i can see is my hand only now that hand if i move it further and further away then i can see you also so similarly for us our our philosophical categorization becomes like a blocker of our vision so if somebody starts saying okay i believe so and so this person is this person is even among devotee circles we all have our conception of what is krishna consciousness and there are some people who are so judgmental even devotees if you come in front of them you have to justify your existence as a devotee to them what are you doing as a devotee so it's like they almost everybody is guilty as unless proven innocent you have to prove to me that you are not a deviant whatever you do they just it is so so what happens for them they become so judgmental they start alienating others now krishna consciousness is far bigger than our conception of krishna consciousness there are other so many ways in which different people according to their backgrounds can be krishna conscious there might be a particular way which we find very very uplifting and that is wonderful but different devotees from their backgrounds their particular personal situations might be having different ways to be krishna conscious so when we bring this filter then what happens is that filter prevents us from seeing properly and we start seeing not the person but we start seeing only the category that cat- philosophical categorization is meant to aid understanding it is not meant to obstruct communication so if we don't learn to see properly okay so like i said the philosophical categorization is a tool it should be used but it should not come so close to our vision that we can't see anything at all we can't see can see only the philosophical categorization it's like a tool when required we use it when not required we can put it aside if you have this example of shri prabhupad when he was in america first one of the first places he stayed was at the mishra yoga institute and this uh, dr mishra he was, he was a yoga teacher and he was from a impersonal orientation and prabhupada and he would have quite heated conflicts about philosophy but i was recently talking with giriraj maharaj giriraj maharaj is one of prabhupada's closest disciples and uh, he is writing a book about shri prabhupada's uh, struggles in in getting the jew temple built so there he says prabhupada told him once that there is dr mishra and i would 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 argue like anything but culturally we were friends so he said that was like a revelation for me so philosophy is just one aspect in our dealing with people so philosophy in philosoph- philosophically we can be at loggerheads but culturally we can be congenial culturally we can be personal culturally we can be warm culturally you can be caring in fact professor this dog is is mishra he is writes in lilam wrote that you know i was so busy in my work and my thing that i would not properly cook my food or everything and he said when i was staying prabhupad would prabhupad was very punctual about his timing of eating so he would cook food for me also and he made sure that my health stayed good so prabhupad did not say you are my wife you starve to death not like that so culture should not be given up in the name of philosophical category and at a basic cultural level everybody needs to be respected as a human being atmopam yena sarvatra samam pashyati yo arjuna sukham va yadi va dukham sayogi paramo mataha krishna says who are the topmost yogis says they see that all living beings are similar to me in what sense similar in their happiness and in their distress this is 6.32 in the bhagavad gita this is a more spiritually evolved rendition of the golden rule in the 10 commandments 
do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. So Krishna is saying, why should you do unto others like that? Because Atma Pamyena Sarvatra Samam Pashyati. See that they are all souls. They are essentially like you. So if we are labelled and neglected, how would we feel? So similarly, others would feel like that. So philosophical categorization should not come in the way of our personal interaction. Yes, based on if a person is an aggressive Mayavadi, that person is trying to impose their impersonalism, their impersonalism on others, then we may need to keep a distance on them. But most people are not like that. For them, philosophy is one part of their life and they want to see how you deal with each other. They are, if they are ready to deal warmly, they are not imposing their ideology. Then we don't have to impose our ideology. We don't have to necessarily label them also. So, when we see people as conscious beings, not as philosophical categories, then we can start being personal with them. Within the devotee community also, we can have some devotees who may label others as these are liberals. Or somebody may say this is conservative. And then there can be a conflict among them also. We are all devotees, we are all trying to practice bhakti. Somebody says this is a very loose devotee. This is a very strict devotee. So now, both of them can have labels like that. Now yes, some different devotees may, may perceive and practice bhakti differently. But still we are devotees. We don't have to take this label to such a high level that it obstructs our normal dealings. Now once there was a nun who used to take care of young orphan girls. And uh, in a, <coughs> and these girls, they would grow up and then they would go into life. So she was asking a young girl, what do you want to become uh, when you grow up? So this girl said, I want to become a prostitute. What? Oh, Hail Mary, Jesus, what have I heard? What did you say, oh girl? He says, I want to become a prostitute. <sighs> Thank God. I thought you wanted to become a protestant. <laughs> so, so sometimes the philosophical categorization can become so overimposing that one may start thinking of becoming a protestant is worse than becoming a prostitute. <laughs> so sometimes we may not literally say like that, but we start treating devotees, even devotees who have some differences from us. Almost like untouchables. Yeah, this person is like that. This person is like that. Oh, generally, if you want to deal with people, see them as conscious beings. We have differences, but we have so many things which are similar. You say from the broader world's point of view, 99% we have similarities. And 1% is difference. So this is the second point that's going to make that. We see people as conscious beings not as philosophical categories. That's how we can become more personal. Any comments or questions about this? Okay, so I'll go to the last point. That we need to take time to form high resolution conception of people. What do I mean by high resolution conception? See, we all have certain conception of people and our brain is finite. So, the brain can process only so much information at a time. Say right now, you are you're in this class and you are hearing the class. Now you might hear some sound of some, maybe some door opening, somebody picking up something, something moving in the background. Now, if that noise is not, is not very strange or out of place, okay, it is there, you are aware that noise is there. But you don't pay much attention to it. But if suddenly you hear a scream. Hey, what's that? Who is that? We gently will pay attention to it. So for most of the time, we have a low resolution conception of many things. Say for example, right now I'm sitting on this chair. Now I just have a low resolution conception that, okay, this is something which I want to sit on. But if this starts shaking and breaking, then, hey, what happened? What kind of chair is this? Is it not a strong enough chair? So then, I, I pay more attention to it. So functionally, we have, so for me, 
a chair is normally just a low, something to sit on. But if it's a place where I'm going to stay for many days, and I'm going to spend many hours in that chair, then I'll see how comfortable is it, how strong is it, does it have a backrest, does it have a headrest, does it have, is it large enough? So then I'll pay more attention and then it will become a more high resolution conception of things. By low resolution and high resolution, we have these images. Sometimes we send images. It's a low resolution, it's a light image, just a few KB. High resolution, sometimes one picture can be into not just MBs but even GBs. So high resolution, so we often have a low resolution conception of things for functional purposes. And the same applies to people also. We have a low resolution conception of people. Say, even with respect to relatives, family members, devotees who work with us. So, for example, some devotee is the cook. Uh, then, our conception of that person is the cook. Cook means, this person should cook, make the food ready in time and it should taste good. That is the only conception we have. But the cook is not just a, is not just a machine who is making producing food in time. Cook is a person. So to form a high resolution conception means we pay conscious attention to them. We put, put time and thought about them. And when we put time and thought in thinking about them, in understanding them, in focusing on them, uh, not just as tools for getting something done. Because our life is so fast paced that we, we operate with a low resolution conception of most people. So a particular person, you might say, this is my boss. And that's all we have. Okay, this boss you know, is very demanding, always makes me do this, do that, do that. But if we spend time talking with people, not talking with people, more than talking with people, listening to people. Just let them speak and listen. If we listen to people, and not just for the purpose of getting it over with, but actually to understand. If we feel that people around us are boring, most likely it is we who are not listening. It is everybody is very interesting. Now, it's up to us whether we want to be interested in them or not. But most often if people feel boring, it is because we are not listening. Because everybody has multiple layers. Everybody has different kinds of desires, different kinds of emotions, different kinds of experiences. And if we listen to them, then gradually they will start speaking. And they will speak, start speaking such interesting things. So we can learn about them, we can learn through their experiences, something which can help us in our own lives also. But, so we need to, a key strategy for forming a high resolution picture of others, conception of others, is listening to them. Most of the times when we interact with people also, it's more for more for speaking to them or instructing or advising them. Mm -hmm. Generally, most people are, are stingy about giving charity. Because it's my hard-earned money, how can I give it? A little hesitant to give charity. Of course, there are people who are generous also. But generally, we don't give charity very easily. But there is, very, there is one charity which we give very liberally. <coughs> can anyone guess? Yes, advice. Preaching is fine. There is nothing we give as freely as advice. And sometimes our advice may be genuinely well-meaning. Hmm? And on a few occasions it might also be good for them. But still, people need to feel understood before they will understand us. I will conclude with this point that in forming a high resolution, the first point I said is that by listening to them, we form a high resolution picture of them, resolution, uh, conception of them. But and if with the low resolution conception, we give them some advice, that may terribly misfire. Because we don't have not understood them at all. But even if we have understood them, still understanding them is not important. Making them feel that we have understood them is also important. Say so suppose we go to a doctor. And as soon as you sit on the chair, doctor says, okay, you take this medicine, you take this medicine, you take this medicine. Okay, you can go now. Hey, what happened? I didn't even tell you my symptoms. I say, no, no, no. I'm expert in them. By just looking at you, I understood the symptoms. And I'm giving this medicine. Say, we may feel, 
Will you ever see this doctor really understand me? Now, even if the doctor is expert enough to understand simply by observation, taking the prescription is not just a matter of giving the prescription. Taking the prescription also requires some faith. The patient has to have faith that his doctor has understood me. So similarly, when we give advice to people, then at that time, we need to consider that actually whether this person feels I have understood them. So when we feel that, when we can make them feel that, then they will understand what we are saying. Now Krishna has this very empathic approach in the Bhagavad Gita. In 6.33 and 34, Arjuna says that controlling the mind is very difficult. Yoyam yogasthvaya prokta samye namadasudana etasyaham na paishami chanchalatva sthitim sthiram chanchalam himana krishna pramathe balavadranam tasyaham nikraham manye vayoriva sudushkaram Just controlling the mind is more difficult than controlling the wind. And now Krishna could have told Arjuna in response to this, just pack up, don't give excuses, use your willpower, control your mind. He doesn't do that. First thing he says is, Asamshayam Mahabhaho Manodur Nikraham Chalam Abhyasena Tukamteya Vairagena Chakruhyate Asamshayam Mahabhaho Undoubtedly it is very difficult to control the mind. Mano durnikraham chalam. But then he says, Abhyasena tu kaunteya. By practice. Just keep practicing. You will be able to control it. Detachment. Detachment means don't expect immediate results. It will take time. Keep practicing and be detached from the immediate results. Now essentially, Krishna does not change the prescription. Krishna doesn't say, oh, you're saying mind control is difficult, so no need to control it. In fact, next verse is very categorical. He says, if you don't control the mind, yoga will not lead to success. You have to control it. But that half a verse makes a lot of difference. First, he assures. So many times when people are disturbed by something, they need assurance more than guidance. They need encouragement more than enlightenment. Encouragement means, yes, you can do it. It's not, it's not catastrophic. It, this is not the end of the world. Enlightenment means, okay, this is how Krishna may be acting. This is what you should do. This is how the reality is. So when we form a high resolution conception of people, then I'm talking about, talking about becoming personal in our dealings. Personal in our dealings means, when people feel that they are understood and then we give them some suggestions, we give them some advice, they feel a personal connection. And sometimes just by listening to people, even if we are not able to give any solution, they just feel understood. And that itself is a big unburdening for them. So therefore, it's important for each one of us to at least for the people who we work closely with, regularly with, we need to form a high resolution conception of them, not just a low resolution conception. Because the low resolution conception with, with some negative labels will easily form. This person never comes on time. This person is forgetful. This person is domineering. This person is irresponsible. This person is lazy. Because when we are working with people, their weaknesses will come out prominently because they will inconvenience us, all, us also. And that we can't deny that. But if we reduce people to those labels, then we will become cold in our dealings with them. And then the personal sweet interaction that can be there, that won't be there. When, when we are impersonal, our interactions are only transactional. Okay, you do this, I do this. It's like a transaction. You go to the shopkeeper, we pay some money and they give us some something that's a transaction but with devotees we want our interactions not just to be transactional but transformational transformational devotees are attracted to krishna devotees are devoted to krishna and by associating with them 
we also want to get the desire for Krishna. We want to get the devotion for Krishna. That's the transformation we want to happen. And Prabhupada, he was able to attract so many people and transform so many people, not just by the classes that he gave. He was very warm and personal in dealing with people. And that's how he attracted them. So, uh, if we learn to be personal with people as Srila Prabhupada was, uh, then we will find that our interaction will rise from being transactional to being transformational. Others will become elevated, we will ourselves become elevated. Our interactions will be something which we look forward to. They will be, they will be enriching for each other. And then the devotee community will become a warm place of shelter for each of us. Where we feel a sense of connection and belonging. And with that sense of connection and belonging, whatever troubles life may send our way, we will feel ourselves sheltered and equipped to face those troubles and move on in our journey toward the Krishna. So I'll summarize. I spoke on the topic of becoming more personal in our dealings. I started, I spoke three points. First was Krishna is a person and is personal. I talked about how Krishna knows each cow, each cow and calls them by name. And Krishna takes time out to look at each gopi and reciprocate love with her through glances. So Krishna is personal. Personal doesn't necessarily mean they have to be effusive public displays of affection. Okay, subtle, just, just eye contact, subtle, just a touch on the shoulder. Subtle things can also uh, convey deep, subtle, deep affection and there can be warm reciprocation. So Krishna is a person and is personal. And second point I spoke was, see people not as philosophical categories, but as conscious beings. Uh, when we practice bhakti, sometimes although our philosophy is personal, our dealings tend to be impersonal. Whereas others whose philosophy might be impersonal, their dealings are personal. Why does that happen? Because we take the philosophical categorization as the sole definition of people. So it's like we take that palm and bring it so close to the eye that we can't see anything at all. So we form a label of people. This person is a Mayavadi, this person is a materialist. This person is a deviant, this person is a liberal, this person is conservative, conservative. And that way, that label prevents us from seeing those people as persons. And Prabhupada would argue with Dr. Mishra, but he was friends. So our philosophical categorization should not come in the way of our cultural interactions with people. So even if Whatever category, whatever personal orientation, whatever their philosophy might be, we need to treat them as conscious living beings. And what, just as we are neglected, if we are labelled, we'll feel bad. So, so too they will feel bad. So the highest yogi Krishna says that yogi sees the equality of themselves with all living beings. And then we learn to think from other people's perspective. Okay, what will give them joy? What will cause them pain? That's that's one way we can become personal. And the third point I talked about is to we, we need to form a high resolution conception of people to personally connect with them. So functionally we have a low resolution conception of things like the chair is simply something I want to sit on, something to sit on. But then if I pay attention there is so much thought I can put in how a chair is and get a clearer understanding. So like that for people also functionally because our life is so fast paced and our brain has finite capacities. So we have low level conception. This person is a cook. This person is a homemaker. This person is a software engineer. This person is a book distributor. Whatever. Now, yes, that's useful functionally. But people are not just their roles. So to form a high resolution conception means to understand them as people with feelings, people with desires, people with hopes, people with distresses. And if people seem boring, that's usually because we are not listening. If we just listen, people will speak so many interesting things and everybody is, is a multi-layered complex person at various, in various ways. And if we, and one strategy for forming a high resolution principle is, high resolution uh, conception is listening. The other is, 
making people feel that they are understood. So we need to take time to understand them and make them feel that we have understood them. A doctor who prescribes without hearing the patient will not be taken very seriously by the patient. Similarly, even if we give good advice, then even if we have understood them, if we make sure that, we, that we, they have understood them, right? they feel understood, then they will take whatever we are saying more seriously. And in that way, when we listen to people and make them feel understood, as they feel unburdened, uh, then by that, the bond in the devotee community will become stronger. We'll sense of, feel a sense of connection and belonging. And that's how we'll be sheltered in this troubled world as we move toward Krishna. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. <coughs> Is there any question anyone has? <coughs> yes. Correct, correct. So, yeah, you can talk anything more about the Okay. So, while preaching and meeting people for the first time, uh, do we need to form a high resolution picture of them at that time? It will be, if they are not interested, we will be wasting our time. Yes, definitely. We, we, are not, we cannot have time to form a high resolution picture of too many people. We just don't have that much time or even brain capacity. So what we need to do is at least begin with the most important people in our lives and take time periodically to form that high resolution picture of them. As far as the new people are concerned, it's largely based on our experience, our impressions. And in general, if you have to give time to new people, it has to be, it has to be reciprocal. So if we are distributing books, we distribute books and somebody has a lot of questions. Can tell them, this is where I stay, this is my number. You can call me and we can talk. Or if you come here, we can talk. Now, if they come here, that means that they are serious. Isn't it? So if they show some commitment in terms of at least coming, then we can have some reciprocation. So on the field, we can spend a few minutes talking with them. Usually when I'm traveling, I don't like to spend much time talking with people. Now, once I was in India traveling and I was chanting and there's some person, he said, Swami Ji, I have a question. I was chanting. So I said, later I am busy. He said, what are you busy? This japa you can do any time. He says, no, no, I want to complete this first. Okay, I'll talk later. So I completed my japa. After about 45 minutes, I asked him, what is your question? He said, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> so basically I realized he was just to kill his time in the train. He had nothing to do. He wanted to ask some question. So, you know, we can't just uh, indiscriminately give time to people. We have to be intelligent. Mm -hmm. So, we definitely have to uh, wait for some in indication of commitment from the other person. Then we can give more time. But I was talking primarily about people who are already committed in various ways. With them, if we operate only on a raw resolution, and that can be alienating. But with new people, we can be reciprocal. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Any other question? Yes. Yes, you are wrong. Uh, <clears throat> you are saying that dealing with you, this must not be transactional, but should be transformational. Yeah. But my understanding is, if we <clears throat> interact with the people or devotees in devotional service, even that that would be transactional, is it? Because by doing devotional service more and more, they transform again. Anyways. Okay. So, if we are dealing with devotees for doing devotional service, isn't devotional service inherently transformational? So, can dealing with devotees be transactional? Okay. See, there is okay. There is conscious purification, and there is okay. There is conscious inspiration. And you could say the subconscious purification. So any class about Krishna we hear, it's purifying. Mm -hmm. But when we come for a class, it's not just that we want to hear about Krishna. We also want to get some inspiration at a conscious level. Isn't it? Okay, I learned something valuable today. 
it is said that even if we don't learn anything valuable from our class, still because it's about Krishna, it can be purified. But even that purification is very gradual. We may not even perceive that so easily. So similarly, with respect, so just said there is there are some classes which are consciously inspiring, action-inducing, uh, intellectually stimulating, whatever. All, all Krishna Katha will be spiritually purifying. But we are talking about also its effect on us as in within our conscious experience. Mm -hmm. Bhakti works at multiple levels. Mm -hmm. So even when we don't feel like chanting, if we chant, we will get purified by that. Mm -hmm. But if we chant and we feel connected with Krishna when we are chanting, we are attentive, we feel connected, and we get much more strength by that. So similarly, it's, it's true in principle that any service that we do in the association of devotees, that will be transformational. But that transformation may be subconscious and too gradual for us to perceive. But some devotees, they are so warm and personal and kind that we just feel, I want to be with this person. So now we shouldn't stop doing service just because it is transactional. So, uh, so if some, some devotees are just like, fix it. Fix it, you know, come, what is the problem to it? You know, I once was staying at a temple and uh, in charge of the temple, he came to me and he said that, uh, he's very candid, he, was. he says, you know, if you have anything which you need to get done, come to me, just call me. If you want to talk, call this person. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't have time to talk. <laughs> He didn't say that, but he made it clear. Now, I appreciate that if he is that some people are in that mood of uh, mood of fixing up and doing things. Now, from those people to expect that they will have a high resolution function, conception, that will be difficult for them. And our expectation may also be unrealistic. So, there are some devotees who, say, especially somebody is a manager, they have to do a lot of things. They will have to be in that mode of getting things done. So, they may have to necessarily operate with a low resolution conception of people. And that's why devotees who work together on high demand projects, it's good that sometimes they take out time together and just be with each other for non-managerial purposes, just for personal spiritual interactions. Then that is the time when they can form high resolution picture of each other. But So we shouldn't give up interactions just because they're transactional. We should know there's transformation happening. But at the same time, uh, we need to also ourselves consciously act in warm and personal ways by which people feel enlightened. People should feel not that devotional service is a duty that I have to do. The devotional service is something which I look forward to do. So that, when will that come? When those whom we are working with, we are warm and personal. Say if we come to do some service and everybody is so busy, okay, you come, now do this. Nobody even looks at us, nobody smiles at us, nobody greets us. And you may still do that service, but we'll feel odd. Oh, if we come, oh, wonderful, you're here. Somebody smiles warmly. We feel it's, it's a small smile. But that makes us feel welcome. So it's not necessarily a huge amount of time which has to be spent for that. But yes, uh, devotional service is always transformational. But for us to get the inspiration to continue it, if it is consciously also transformational, not just transaction, that is helpful. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Any other Vaishnavis have any questions? Okay. So thank you very much. Shla Prabhupada ki. Kantaraj Srimad Bhagavatam ki. Itai Gaur Premanande. Prabhupada ki chai.